Hello and welcome to Scholar One's Abstract Submission Platform. The purpose of this video is to give an overview of the system capabilities and walk you through the process of abstract collection, peer review, compiling your program, and exporting your data. Please keep in mind that Scholar One is a highly configurable system and that the examples and verbiage used in this site will not necessarily reflect your society's individual workflow but rather they're set up to demonstrate the basic functionality, answer the most common questions, and encourage more specific ones. What you are currently seeing on the screen is a generic demo site. I will take us through each step of the process, generally talking about the system and functionality. When accessing Scholar One's websites for the first time, it is important to disable your pop-up blocker. We are starting on the home or login page. And the first thing you can see up top is our example banner. This is where your society's banner would go to add customization and branding to your site. By clicking on the banner, users will be taken to your events home page. We're also able to post announcements on the login or home page. This is done from the admin center. And all of the text on the home page is customizable from the admin center, which means you control the dates and the text on the page. As you can see, we can link out to emails uh, and as well as links to emails, you could add downloads to PDFs, for example, or links to other websites. There are a couple of ways to log into Scholar One. Firstly, if you already have an account, just type in your username and password. If you know that you have an account, but have forgotten your password, use the Forgot Password link, which will link your account to your current email and enable users to reset their own password. If an account has not already been created for the user, they can create an account using the top bar or the right side menu. Accounts can also be created by the admin within the system, either individually or they can be imported in bulk. Also, Scholar One enables you to transfer accounts from year to year. So if you use Scholar One in the past, we're able to transfer uh, all user accounts and they retain their username, password, and account information. Throughout the system, you will notice the help button at the top of each page. By clicking on this button, users will be taken to the Scholar One Abstracts support page. On this page, you can view FAQs or contact support. You can also browse various training material such as PDFs or video tutorials. Let's log into the system. Imagine that my account has not yet been created. Click on the Account Create button. On this page, you will notice that there are various steps that you need to complete in order to create an account successfully. The first is the General Information tab. Any fields throughout Scholar One which appear with a red asterisk denote required fields. You will not be able to complete the step without filling this information out first. On this screen, we see that the first name and last name are required as well as the institution. Scholar One has the ability to collect reviewer information. For example, if someone would like to volunteer to be a reviewer, they can add their area of expertise on this step and it will be visible to the admin only. Below, we have a series of custom questions that have been configured, but this does depend on how you would like to create accounts and what information you would like to collect on the account level. I've typed in my name, last name, and institution, and now we'll move on to the next step. As you can see, a warning message has popped up because I haven't completed all of the necessary information. I can fix the errors or continue with no changes. Let's fix the errors.
click on Continue. Once we have completed all of the necessary information, a green check mark will appear. Let's go on to the next tab, which is Contact Information. Here we have the option to add our address, country, phone number, and email, which is required when creating any account in Scholar One. The next tab is the Access tab. This tab shows users which permissions they will be given upon account creation. Usually, it's only one or more submission roles. The Disclosures tab allows us to collect information on the account level. Next is the User ID and Password. User IDs and passwords are case sensitive. And lastly is the Privacy Policy tab. Currently, we have the Clarivate Analytics Privacy Policy linked. However, you can also link your own privacy policy if you have one and prompt users to acknowledge it upon login. If you have successfully completed all of the information, you will be taken directly into the welcome page. We can see up top that the help link is visible from any page in Scholar One, as well as your banner. Your banner will be visible on each page of the website. On the left, you're able to add a custom logo, as well as list your contact information. What we're seeing here is the contact information for our support site, but you could list your admin's contact information, as well as link out to your website. This text area can be expanded and edited by you. When clicking on the edit link, a pop-up will appear which is much like a word processing tool and you're able to add images as well as well as messages, any links or downloads to PDFs. We can see my name here. By clicking on the drop-down menu, I can go into my general or contact information as well as disclosures or reset my user ID and password at any time. Let's go into the Submission tab. The first thing we can see on this page is some additional instructions on how to submit an abstract or contact technical support. Any draft abstracts will appear on this page, as well as completed submissions. We can see the title, the ID of our abstract, the date it was last modified, the submission deadline, as well as the type of submission. Using the Action drop-down menus, you're able to edit drafts, view emails associated with the submission, or delete the drafts. Any emails associated with the submission will appear in the Messages Center at the top of the page. By clicking on the drop-down, we can go into the emails which have already been sent to a regular email as well, or into invitations if your site uses speaker management. Let's go on to creating a new submission. On this site, we currently have two submission types. On step one, submission type, we're able to choose the type of submission we'd like to create, as well as view a definition and the deadline for the particular submission. You're able to create multiple submission roles in Scholar One, and they each have their own timeline, meaning your deadlines will not necessarily have to be the same. For this example, I'll choose the oral or poster submission type. Click on Continue. Step 1 Submission Type has been completed and a green check mark has appeared. I'm taken into Step 2 Title and Body. On the right side of the screen, I can see an ID. This is the control ID of my abstract, and this is what I will reference for all future communication either with admins or with Scholar One support. 
The top bar displays my deadline, the name of the person submitting the abstract, and the total amount of characters allowed. By clicking on the full instructions, I will be able to read more detailed instructions on how to create my submission. As with creating accounts, all fields which have a red asterisk are required. Beside each field, you will notice a help popover. This allows me to give additional instructions to my submitters. Proceed to fill out the form by completing all of the fields that contain a red asterisk. Users do not need to complete their form all in one sitting. They can create a draft, save the work that's already been done, and return to complete their submission at a later time. Scholar One allows you to add tables as well as upload images to your submission. By clicking the Save and Continue button, if we have filled out all of the necessary information, a green check mark will appear beside Step 2. Step 3 is the Properties page. Here, users can select a presentation type, a category to submit to, as well as a subcategory. We can configure a number of keywords to either be required or elective. Keywords can be preloaded, or users can use freeform and search keywords which have already been typed into the system. Below are a set of custom questions, and you're able to customize your submission form so that it contains a number of custom questions. Custom questions can be in the format of checkboxes, as we see here. They can be file uploads, as well as radio buttons, drop-down menus, text areas, or calendar responses. The next step is step four, authors. Here we can see that the submitter has automatically been added but they are able to be removed. Select an affiliation or create a new affiliation for the submitter. Search the system for additional authors. If they do not appear in your search, create a new author. Below, we see an example of a custom question text field. Once I have filled out all of the necessary information, I'm taken to the very last step of the submission process, which is the review and submit step. Once I have reviewed all of the entered information and I am happy with how my submission appears on the page, I can view and print the proof of my abstract. If all of the steps are complete, the Submit button will appear. Once an abstract has been submitted, I will receive an automatic email from the system confirming my submission. This email will also appear in the Messages Center on my Scholar One account. If we go back to the Submission tab, we'll be able to see our submission on the View Submissions page. Next, let's take a look at the Session Proposal tab. If I would like to submit a session proposal, I would click on the Session Proposal tab. As you can see, as with the regular submissions, I can view any drafts or submitted proposals. I can select from the Action menu to edit my draft, view emails associated with this session proposal, or delete my draft. Click on Create New Session Proposal. Select the session type you would like to submit to, the topic, enter the session title, and summary. If you have not correctly filled out all the information, a warning message will appear. Session proposals do not need to be completed in one go. Users can save their drafts, and return at a later time to submit. Additional questions can be added to the session proposal. As with abstract submission, we can also see the session proposal ID at the top right of the screen. Step 2 of creating a session proposal is linking participants. Click on the Add Participant button and search the system for existing accounts. If an existing account does not appear according to your search, you can create a new account. Step three of the session proposal process is linking abstracts. Click on Add Abstract, type in the title, body, and add authors to this abstract.
The last step is the review and submit. Again, if there are any incomplete steps, we will receive a warning message and not be able to submit prior to completing those steps. Once all of the steps have successfully been completed, a submit button will appear. Clicking on that button will submit your session proposal as well as trigger an email to be sent to your account and email address. Now that we've submitted an abstract in a session proposal, let's take a look at the Review Center. On this example site, we have three reviewer roles configured. The first one is the Review Center admin, and this is where all the submissions would go to await assignment. On the left, we see two sections. The first one is abstracts and then session proposals, depending on whether your site uses session proposals. The first tab under abstracts is assign reviewers. As an admin, you are able to either import a list of reviewers or add the reviewer role to existing users. We would select our role to work with, in this case, the chair role, for example. On the left are the list of available reviewers, and on the right are abstracts which have been submitted. By clicking the plus sign, we can expand the assignments to see which abstracts are assigned to which reviewer, or vice versa on the right side, you can see which reviewers are assigned to which abstract. Expand the left side, and you will also be able to see the areas of expertise by reviewer if you choose to collect those. And let's say if I were the review admin now, I would select the abstracts that I would like to assign to a certain reviewer and simply drag and drop them onto the reviewer. And we can see now that my abstracts have been assigned. There is also the multiple assignment tool, which lets us um, select a number of abstracts and assign them to multiple reviewers at the same time. Again, moving to the left, we have the automatic reviewer assignment tool. We can enter certain parameters, such as the maximum number of uh, abstracts assigned to a reviewer or the minimum number of required abstracts to be assigned to a reviewer, and then limit them based on the reviewer role or the submission roles. And this will automatically assign your parameters to the reviewers in the system. Here we can also assign sessioners or we can assign reviews by category if your site uses category and also topic. Let's go to the reviewer score report tab. Again, here we would select the role we would like to work with. And in this tab, we are able to see all of the abstracts which have been assigned for review. Again, we can expand to view which reviewers are assigned to the submission as well as their scores, whether there was a conflict of interest, wrong category, what the reviewer average score was, and also we can see the recommendations in this grid. This grid can also be used to make a final decision. The reviewer status report lists all of the reviewers which have assignments, and from here we're able to see the number of assigned abstracts per reviewer, the number they've completed, and the number that's remaining. Uh, to be completed. The R score column is the average score of a reviewer across all of their assignments for the given role, and it could be helpful in identifying if someone is a very lenient reviewer or particularly tough. You can also send emails directly to reviewers from this grid, and all of the grids within the Review Admin Center can be exported to Excel. This particular site uses session proposals, so we'll quickly go into the session proposal tab. As you can see, we can also assign reviewers from here, assign a sessioner, or view the reviewer score report or reviewer status report for session proposals. The review session proposals tab is formatted in the same way as the review abstracts tab, and from here uh, we can also assign reviewers or sessioners view the reviewer score report or the reviewer status report. The only difference is that now we are looking at session proposals on the right and again our reviewers on the left. 
As a review admin, my main role would be to monitor the submissions, assign them to the designated chair, and then from there, the chair would distribute them among their pool of reviewers. Let's pretend I'm a reviewer. What we will do is go to our admin center, search for a user who has the reviewer role and assigned abstracts, and proxy in to view the reviewer grid. Currently, we're proxying into the site as one of our reviewers. This grid shows all of the assignments that this particular reviewer has been assigned. Once an assignment has been completed, a green check mark will appear on the left in the first column of the grid. By clicking on the control ID, the reviewer is able to view the proof of the abstract. We have the title in this grid. Also, by clicking on the view or edit link, they're able to leave confidential comments to the admin or comments to the authors. These comments do not have to be required, such as the confidential comment here, but they can be required, such as the comments for the authors in this case. On this particular site, the reviewer is able to see who the presenting author is, but we can also configure the site to enable blinded review. Should the reviewer have a conflict of interest and is unable to score the abstract, they would take this box here. If the reviewer considers that this abstract is in the wrong category, they would tick this box here. The scores can be individually configured for each reviewer role, so each different reviewer role would have its own scorecard. Right now we're seeing originality organization methods and scholarship. By clicking on the drop-down menu, the reviewer is able to select the score. Once all of the scores have been selected, an average score will be calculated. They are also able to make a recommendation. In this case, what we're seeing is they can either recommend that the abstract be accepted as an oral presentation, a poster, or reject it. The last column is the overall score calculated based on this particular scorecard. As you can see, I have selected the score for all of the required fields and a green check mark has appeared to denote that the review for this particular abstract is complete. We're going to end the proxy now and go back into our Review Center admin role. The final decision on whether an abstract is accepted or rejected can either be made by the reviewer admin or a chair role, depending on how your site is configured. We will go into the reviewer score report, select the role to work with, and find our abstract which was just scored. We can expand the abstract to view the scores given by the particular reviewer and look at the overall score. Now, you may be ready to decision your abstract. If an abstract is decisioned as reject, it will not go on to sessioning. If an abstract is decisioned with a positive decision, such as accept, it will go into the session center and be ready to be assigned to a session. Once an abstract has been decisioned positively, it will go on into the session center and be ready to be assigned to a session within your program. Abstracts can either be inserted into sessions by sessioners or by the session center admin. Let's go into the session center admin role. The first tab we see is our dashboard and instructions. Underneath is the meeting setup tab. Here, we will set up our program. Create your program by entering in the parameters such as the program title, start and end date, the daily start time and end time. We're inputting the days of the annual meeting as well as the earliest possible start time and the latest possible time for any day of the meeting.
At this point, we can also enter rooms where our program will be scheduled, whether that is a venue or a virtual meeting. We can add the availability, such as the date and the time that each room would be available for presentations. We can also categorize the sessions by types. They can be groups such as oral or poster sessions. You can create available types in this tab and also color code them. Underneath that, we see the topics tab. And same here, uh, the session topics are typically used as a secondary way of categorizing sessions. So putting them into related groups. For example, you might have a type that's called uh, oral or poster, but you may also want to break these groups further down into, let's say, basic or clinical based sessions. The next tab is the hosts tab. And in this system, session hosts are individuals that oversee sessions during the meeting. These can be, for example, moderators or session chairs. And in this grid, you can create a list of available hosts that can then be assigned to any session. You are also able to restrict the number of sessions that a person may be assigned to. So we can enter the maximum number of sessions the person is allowed to oversee. And we can give everyone uh, out of this list the same maximum if needed. Once we have set up the parameters for our meeting, we would go on into the sessioning tab, sessions and events. And this is where the sessions would be built. We can create either new sessions or new events or edit existing sessions or events. Click on the create a new session. Enter the session title and any other required fields such as the session type, the duration of the session, or a session description. Once the required fields have been filled out, you'll be able to add the hosts to this session and manage the abstracts. Click on the Add Edit Hosts tab, and a list of all your available hosts will appear. Simply select your host and drag and drop into the session. Click on the Manage Abstracts tab. From here, we're able to filter all of the existing abstracts within the system. There's this Unassigned Abstracts button that you can click to search for any abstract that hasn't yet been assigned to a session. Or you can search the abstracts by parameters such as the author's first name, the category, the presentation type, a subcategory, or even a control ID of the abstract. Once you have filtered, the search will yield all of the abstracts that have not been assigned. And you can select the abstracts which you would like to add to the session. Simply select all of the abstracts that you would like to add to the session and drag and drop them into the session. From here, you're able to change the order of the abstracts, assign final IDs, assign DOIs, assign the start and end time, for your abstracts, assign the start and end time of your abstracts, as well as input a default duration for each presentation.
As with other centers throughout the site, by clicking on the control ID, you will be able to view the proof of the abstract. If configured, you could also edit the abstract from within the session center. We are able to add placeholders. Placeholders are usually breaks within the session or uh, Q&A slots. By selecting a certain abstract or group of abstracts, you can withdraw them from the session or remove them from the session. The mass update feature allows you to add final IDs, DOIs, or start and end times in mass. Once you have added presentations, the system will automatically inform you how much remaining time is left within the sessions based on the calculation of the number of abstracts and the assigned default duration time. From this grid, we can also add final IDs to our sessions, either one by one or in mass. And we can view the overall statistics, such as the number of assigned abstracts within a session. Now that we have created our sessions and events and linked our presentations into the session, let's go and schedule them. In this grid, You'll be able to sort by session title, type, or topic. Choose your session and simply drag and drop into a time slot. This grid is organized by rooms and the room availability time. By hovering over the scheduled session or event, you are able to see the duration. And by double clicking on the scheduled session or event, the session information will display below. Click on events to schedule your events. As we can see, the scheduled sessions are color-coded in this case. We can also sort by color. Once your program has been scheduled and finalized, you may begin to use the speaker management tool to invite your presenters, hosts, and session owners to attend your meeting. The speaker management system allows you to create custom invitations, create targeted emails, and track the invitation responses. Presenters, hosts, and owners receive the designated invitation email, log into their account, and accept or decline the invitation. They may view their formal invitation through the Messages Center at the top of the screen. The Speaker Management Grid has three main sections. Uh, we can see the Manage Invitations tab, the Messages templates, and the Email templates. The Email Templates tab allows you to create customized email templates, and there's no limit to the number of email templates that can be created. Email templates are customized emails that request the presenter to log into your meeting site and to view their invitation message in their Messages Center. Reminder emails and notification emails will also be available in their Messages Center. Users can access the invitation either by logging in or clicking on a deep link within the email message template. The Messages Templates tab allows you to create customized invitation templates and again there's no limit to the number of invitation templates that can be created. Each template can be customized based on the task or on the recipient. The Manage Invitations tab allows you to send emails and the ability to select which invitation template and which email template each host and presenter sees in their message center. This also allows you to track individual invitation responses. You may also send reminders and notifications via the Manage Invitations grid. 
This grid shows the real time status of invitations. As we can see on the screen, we have invitations which have not been sent yet. We have accepted invitations and also a declined invitation. Special tags can also be added to both the email and the message templates, such as tags which include the scheduled time of the presentation or session information. The host, presenter, or owner will note their acceptance or decline within their view of the invitation. You will often want to create several different invitations geared toward different types of presenters. For instance, you may want to have certain information in a presenter template and different information in a host template. Or uh, you may also want to have a different message for oral presenters versus poster presenters, for example. You can also choose to add custom questions to a message template. A custom question can include a file upload requirement or a targeted question with a radio button or multi-select boxes. Common uses for custom questions are full paper uploads, speaker biographies, e-posters, pre-recorded video files, or opt-in questions. The final tab in the Session Center is the Reports tab. We can see the event report, which is a summary of all of the events created for the program. This displays as a grid on the screen with the event title and information and can be printed. We also have the Participant Conflict Report. The Participant Conflict Report allows us to check whether presenters or session hosts have conflicts by session type or session topic. We can also add a specific time buffer, for example, to allow them to go from one session to another. Now that we have explored the submission, review, and session centers, let's take a quick look at the admin center and its most commonly used features. The admin center dashboard features a quick overview of your collection process divided into three phases, submission collection, review, and sessioning, as well as links to helpful tools and reports. Use the Search tab in the Admin Center to create a wide range of reports, choose an output format, filter based on the needed criteria, and add fields to your reports. Create new users or assign additional roles to existing users. The Merge tool enables the admin to search for and merge duplicate accounts. Search for users, proxy into their account to view the system from the point of view of the user, and complete tasks in their name. Give users late access or early access to any role. Scholar One's system emails will automatically be triggered by certain events within the system. This includes account creation, submission of abstracts, and when abstracts are returned to draft or withdrawn. Create your own custom templates insert system or custom tags, and send notifications and reminders. Emails can be sent either by abstract, person, or session. Target and filter who the email will go to according to the search criteria and send mass emails. Use the various search options to view or resend emails that have been triggered or previously sent. Check if certain email addresses have been blocked. Create tags to save time and ensure consistency with instructions and emails. For example, if one of your deadlines is using a tag and that date changes, simply by updating the tag, the change will show across the site. You can update general configuration items for your site from the Admin Center. For example, would you like the instructions link or the help popovers to appear in your submission form, or if you would prefer to allow or prevent authors from withdrawing or deleting abstracts. Load a list of institutions for authors to choose from, 
and decide whether to allow text formatting within the title or body fields of the submission. Scholar1 is also integrated with Ringgold. Edit page instructions. Post an announcement message on the login page or select the default country for your users. Use this section of the site to configure the proof. That is, which parts of the abstract will be visible depending on the user's role. You can configure a different abstract proof for each role by choosing from the selected role menu. For example, an admin's proof may contain the name and the scores of all the authors, while a submitter's or reviewer's proof may not. Using the site schedule, as an admin, you can control the open and close dates and times of each role on your site individually. The site will automatically open and close roles for the users based on the dates entered in the schedule. This means that you will easily be able to extend deadlines. Control what is displayed on the Welcome page in the Welcome and File Uploads tab. Add a welcome message or image, display additional information, display the site contact information, as well as upload your own banner or logo. This file upload option also allows you to upload documents, such as instructional PDFs or forms, and create file paths within the text areas. Attach your own privacy policy and prompt users to review the updated privacy policy upon login. Once all of your data has been collected, reviewed, and sessioned, the Data Export tool provides two export options. Either download all of the abstract session or people data in XML format, or choose whether to apply filters or to include collected files. The second option is to choose from a list of pre-formatted standard exports, such as the abstract or program book. Let's click on the link to view a sample of the export formatting. Scholar1 also offers the option of creating custom exports, which would be tailored according to your specific display items, formatting, and needs. Thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoyed this basic overview of Scholar1 Abstracts. Please contact us to schedule an in-person demo if you have further questions related to implementing your organization's more specific workflow. Goodbye.